comes from the book of Acts, chapter 5, verses 27 through 32. Please remain standing for the reading of God's Word. The apostles were brought before the council, where the high priest confronted them. In no uncertain terms, we demanded that you not teach in this name. And look at you. You have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. And you are determined to hold us responsible for this man's death. Peter and the apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God has exalted Jesus to his right side as leader and savior so that he could enable Israel to change its heart and life and to find forgiveness for sins. We are witnesses of such things, as is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey Him. This is the Word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. Well, the Easter eggs have all been found, hopefully. Uh, the uh, Easter lilies and beautiful flowers have left the sanctuary. All the excitement is behind us. Did you have an exciting Easter? We sure have this <laughs> We have that. Easter Day has come and gone, but I have news for you this morning. It is still Easter. It is still Easter. And it's still Easter for several reasons. One reason that it's still Easter is because we are now in the 50 days of Easter. The 50 days of Easter is the time when Jesus was risen and Jesus went around the area revealing the resurrection. Christ to the people and encouraging the disciples, teaching them to obey His commandments. And from now to, to Pentecost Sunday, we are in the season that we call Easter, the season of Easter. It's also still Easter because every Sunday is Easter. We believe that every Sunday is a time when we celebrate the resurrection of Christ. Every Sunday is a little Easter, and even today. And lastly, of course, it's still Easter because Jesus is still risen. 2,000 years later, our Lord Jesus is still alive, still risen. But there's a fourth reason that we're still celebrating Easter. And we're, this is the reason that we're going to talk about for the next several weeks. And the question, after Easter Sunday has come and gone, and Easter Sunday has come and gone, after Easter Sunday has come and gone. Now what? Now what? We have this big event, we have this big celebration, but is that the end of the story? You know, in some ways it is. Of course, Jesus conquered death, the power of the resurrection. Death loses, Jesus wins, Jesus has the victory. So in some ways that is at least the most important part of the story. However, that's not the end of the story. The story isn't over. You know, Jesus is risen, but Jesus also wants to be alive so that you can be alive. Jesus conquers death so that we as his people can be alive as well. The resurrection is not the end of the story. As a matter of fact, our story begins after Easter. Our story begins at the tomb that is empty. Jesus' body rose from the dead, resurrected, and now the church, the body of Christ, we are now the resurrected body in the world. Do you know that? It's a good question that you know, I've heard quite often is, you know, how do people encounter the resurrected Christ today? You know, Jesus really is alive today. Why doesn't he reveal himself to us like he did to the disciples, like he did to Paul on the road to Damascus? Why isn't he doing that? The answer is, he is doing that. He's doing that for you. He's 
doing that through us. He's doing that through the Easter people that we call the church. You know that song we sing, Easter people, raise your voices. Jesus is alive. You know how Jesus chooses to be alive in the world? Through us. Through me and you. We are the Easter people. And we are called to be bold witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus through our words and through our lives. You know, the book of Acts tells us the story of the first followers of the resurrected Christ. The first Easter people. And as we see their engagement with the world, we can, we can gain some understanding from what it means to be Easter people. And the first thing that our scripture shares with us, I think, is that to be Easter people, we must boldly obey God, even when it's contrary to what's easy. To be Easter people means to be those who boldly obey God, even when it's contrary to what's easy. You know, as the apostles were being harassed for preaching about Jesus, they were told not to speak in his name. Don't talk in his name. Don't talk about this resurrected Christ anymore. We don't want to hear it. But this is how they respond. We must obey God rather than humans. We must obey God. Obey. You know, obey is one of those words that we don't like a whole lot, do we? I think it's because we associate it with, with different things. You know, we associate obey maybe with you know, trying to train a dog, right? To listen to our commandments and to do what we want them to do. When we think of obey, we might think of a dictator who has demands on his people. And if they don't listen to what he tells them to do, he will punish them. When we hear the word obey, I think we have those negative connotations to it. So when we hear the scripture telling us to obey God, what does that mean exactly? You know, with God, obe obedience isn't about dictatorship. Instead, obedience is about trust. It's about trust. You know, when it comes down to it, church family, our faith is basically about trust. Who do you trust? It's about trust. You know, when Pastor Kim leads us in our affirmation of faith, we say that we believe in God the Father. We say that we believe in Jesus Christ. We say that we believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe in the church. That's not a cognitive belief. That's not a mind thing. Or at least that's not only a mind thing. When we say that we believe in God, we're saying that we completely trust God. We surrender our lives over to God because we completely and fully trust Him. To believe in God is to trust God. Even when things don't make sense. Does life not make sense sometimes? No, that, right? But to believe in God is to trust God even when things don't make sense. It's to trust God when we find ourselves wandering out in the deep waters with our feet unable to touch the bottom. Trusting that God is somehow there to hold us, even when we can't swim. You know, I think I've shared with you before <clears throat> that growing up, I had this unbelievable fear of water. Just scared of water. My mom would have to bathe me when I was a child in two inches of water in the bathtub. But she put three inches in there and I thought I was going to drown. I thought Jaws was going to come up and get me. I don't know what it was. But two inches was okay. You get too much deeper than that, I was terrified. I was afraid of water. I remember once I was in a, in a pool party with my family and my cousin. I was on a raft in the water. This was a big deal for me to get on a raft in the water. And as I was on that raft, my cousin, who I still don't like to this day, <laughs> pushed me over into the water. And um, if, I, if I wasn't scared at that point, I was certainly scared after that. And I told myself I would never trust him again. I would never get in the water again. Well, a few years later, I found myself in the water again. 
And I was with my dad. And we were at this place called Crystal Lake. I don't know if any of you ever heard of Crystal Lake. I think it's over in the southwest of Georgia. And we were there, and I was in about eight deep of water, you know, as far out as I wanted to go. And my dad told me, Josh, you're 25 years old. It's time to get back to school. I wasn't quite that. was no, it's as far as I'm going to go. I was scared. But I eventually waded out into the deeper water. And the reason that I did that was because my dad was with me. I did what my dad asked because I trusted him. And that day, as I got in that deeper and deeper and deeper water, I learned how to swim. I learned how to swim. I conquered my fear of the water. You know, obeying God is about trusting that God knows what's best in our lives. It's about living our lives as God wants us to live, even when things don't make sense. You know, obeying God sometimes leads us to do things that other people might think is crazy. Obeying God might be turning down a huge job promotion with a huge pay increase to go somewhere that God's calling you to go. Obeying God might mean packing up all your things and moving somewhere else. Obeying God might mean selling your most valuable possession to give that money to the poor for someone for the sake of the kingdom. Obeying God might lead you to do things that others might think is crazy. That's what it means to be a Christian. To trust. Even when it doesn't make sense. Even when the waters seem deep and you can't swim. Because that's God's desire for us. To be able to swim. To be able to freely serve Christ. In joyful obedience. God desires that His children obey Him. Even when it's contrary to what we think. Because God knows best. However, as we're talking about this, I think it's important that we are careful when we are talking about obeying God. It's important to be careful. You know, some of the worst events in human history happened when people thought that they were obeying God. You know, as crazy as Hitler was, I think part of him thought that he was obeying God when he was doing the things that he was doing. You know, there are terrorist attacks happening all over the world because people think that they are obeying God. And there have even been horrible events happening in the name of Jesus Christ when we gathered to worship today. There have been atrocities done in His name because people thought that they were obeying God. You know, obedience to God is the most important thing that we can do, but we have to be careful and discern God's voice. You know, when I was growing up in the church, I grew up in the Pentecostal tradition. Um, church of God, Pentecostal tradition. One of the questions that I always got from my friends at school, because I was the only Pentecostal in class, and one of the questions I always got from them was, do y'all play with snakes? <laughs> Aren't y'all the church that plays with snakes? Now, when I was a kid, I had no idea what they meant by that. I was like, I think so. The next Sunday, I was looking around, making sure you know, there were no snakes in the sanctuary, but I, I eventually found out that there are a small number of churches Tennessee and Kentucky and in the mountains and other areas that actually are what you call snake handling churches. Snake handling churches. And they actually did a show recently on television. It was pretty fascinating about these churches and about their pastors. And during their worship services, when they feel that the spirit is moving in a significant way, they bring out poisonous snakes 
in the sanctuary. And if they're filled with the Spirit, they hold the snakes. And they dance around and see holding these poisonous, venomous snakes right in their sanctuary. Now you're probably asking, where in the world would they get an idea like that from? Where did that come from? Guess what? It came from Scripture. They thought they were being obedient to God. Mark 16 says that those, these signs will be associated with those who believe. They will throw out demons in my name. They will speak in new languages. They will pick up snakes with their hands. If they drink anything poisonous, it will not hurt them. So they knew the Bible. They use these scriptures to justify what they do. Now, unfortunately, if you watch that show, unfortunately, one of the pastors that was on that show was bitten by a poisonous snake and he died. And this, ha this has happened to you know, many of the snake handlers throughout the years. Now, here's the thing. I believe that these people are genuine with their faith. I believe that these folks love God. But I also think that they have wrongly interpreted this scripture and are wrongly obeying this scripture that's causing them harm and even their children harm. You know, we are seeking to discern what God wants from us, how God wants us to obey when we are reading God's word. We need a few things to ensure that we are hearing from God and not ourselves. Now, I think one thing that we need Humility. We need humility. We need to come to the scriptures when we read God's holy word, assuming that we know very little about it and eager to learn like a child. You know, when's the last time that you read scripture genuinely wanted to be changed by it? Genuinely wanted your mind to be changed? You know, my experience is that we often go to Scripture not to be changed, not to learn, but to have our own beliefs confirmed. God calls us to stand before His Word alone. As we do that, God will speak to us. Another thing that we need when we, we, we're trying to discern God's voice for us, we need a community. We need people in our lives who can give us guidance. If God's telling you to do something radical, like sell your house and move to Africa to be a missionary, God might be telling you that. But boy, it probably wouldn't hurt to find some people to talk to about it first. To find some wise voices. God gives us the gift of each other. The gift of wisdom. The gift of a community to help us discern God's will for us. You know, one of my favorite moments throughout the week in, in our church, there's so many things that I love about being part of this church. One of my favorite things is our Wednesday morning Bible study. We meet at 10 o'clock every Wednesday morning. We'd love to have you come. And you know, one thing that I love about that is that it is a very discussion-based class. When I show up, I let them know real quickly, I do not have the answers. So we need to talk about this together. And we read scripture together and we have a wonderful discussion. And it's amazing what happens when the scripture is central to your conversation. The more people that you have willing to share, the more you learn, the more you grow. As we seek to discern God's will for our life, we need each other. We need other voices. We need the church. God calls us to be His witnesses. Through obedience. God calls us to truth. But the good news this morning is that God does not leave us alone. God doesn't leave us alone. Listen to the end of this scripture that we read. We are witnesses of such things as is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who You know, on this, Easter, on this second Sunday of Easter, we're celebrating that Jesus is risen. And we know that Jesus ascends to the Father and He leaves the church.
to do His work. But He does not leave us alone. He doesn't leave us by ourselves. He gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit to encourage us, to guide us, to correct us, to empower us, to give us strength as we face the challenges ahead. You know, as I read this scripture this week, and as I see the early disciples that we just read about risking their lives to be bold witnesses, I can't help but think of all the Christians around the world right now who are being witnesses for Christ at the risk of suffering, even more. You know, the truth is, many of us will never experience that kind of opposition that the early disciples faced. At least I hope we don't. We might, but I hope we don't. However, while we may not ever experience that, we have Christian brothers and sisters all around the world today suffering because of their faith in Christ. You know, there have been more, some studies suggest that there have been more martyrs for the Christian faith in the last century than all the others combined. That's your brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's learn from them. Let's see their bold witness. And let's seek to live our lives boldly as well. As we close our sermon today, I want to be mindful of those marks. Every Sunday, I should, we, we should offer a prayer for them, being mindful of the Christians all around the world who are suffering for the sake of the cross. Let's bow together as we pray for them. Hear our confession of God. We can't really imagine what it would be like to suffer for your name. Open our hearts to the men and women sitting behind bars because they voiced their faith in you. Raise our thoughts to the cry of those in need simply because they bear the name Christian. Cause us to respond to the youth whose education is denied because they dare to name your name. Faithful God, Make us aware of those for whom at great cost and greater peril quietly call themselves your disciples in a world where being a Christian means persecution. Lord, we hold them in your light. Help us to kneel with them in prayer. Tune our hearts to hear their voices. When we wake, when we eat, while we worship, while we work and when we go to 